Good day, everybody. Uh, welcome to our last webinar of uh, 2017. Uh, today we're going to cover basically what we went through a bit of in the Worldwide Technology Meeting at Dalim earlier this month. So uh, strictly staying on the ES55 right now. There's a, there's a lot of stuff to cover on the product. I'm going to try to touch mostly on some of the kind of key features that, uh, that they really spoke about the most, especially in the training. Uh, and I'll mention some of the other things kind of just in passing at, at the end of the uh, presentation. So some of the stuff we're going to cover is going to be Amazon S3 support, the new check-in, check-out functionality using Latitude with web dev, the site architecture, plug-in components, ES API, or changes in the ES API, the new workflow editor, and new features of uh, Dialog HTML5. So first thing I want to cover is going to be the S3 support. Um, this, is, this was brought up, I believe, uh, first time at Duo uh, last year. I don't even think they mentioned it at the Worldwide Technology Meeting last year. Um, it's took, taken some time, but they do have it integrated now inside of ES55. The only thing they're missing still is actual monitoring at the file system level. They will be able to get there. It's just going to take them a little bit longer. So right now, the it's kind of uh, kind of like an unmonitored file system view, like if you don't have the JDF device running on it. So just to talk about S3 a little bit. Um, Christoph Bimler did a kind of full session during the the meetings where he talked a lot about AWS and I guess I believe in Europe they have a lot of their customers starting to move to AWS now that Dalim supports the S3 storage. Um, he kind of sounded like he was working for Amazon, but I um, wanted to pick up a couple of the points he talked about. With regular architecture, you know, the pros are that you do have typically direct attached storage, even if you're going through a typical like a data center, kind of like the solution we offer our customers. Um, it's VMware based and you have SSD or SAS devices direct attached or fiber, through fiber channel, typically to your VMs. So it is faster than you would have with S3. But I found in the little testing I've been doing, the S3 storage does perform decently. Um, cons, obviously on the typical architecture, the main one there is typically the expense of it. It is a bit more expensive than S3, unless you're really using S3 with a lot of, uh, you know, get requests and things like that that you do get charged for, which makes it hard to monetize S3 unless you really know what you're doing. Um, the other con, uh, he really didn't put this on the slide, but, you know, a con of the re of normal architecture, not S3 architecture, is your storage you're going to buy in blocks typically you're going to say i need 10 terabytes of storage and when you start running low on that 10 terabytes you get more storage and then you have to grow your file system at the os level and it does take some administrative work with s3 you're not buying a predefined amount of storage you're getting charged for what you're using the whole time so you're not paying for excess storage that you haven't made use of and you really don't ever have to grow your file system that's taken into account by um, Amazon themselves. Um, the cons are, of course, it, it is slower, especially when you're dealing with large files. And as I was saying, it, it's hard to monetize. The configuration for it basically is that for the uh, ESFS, there's now a new type where it's AWS S3. You tell it that you, the information you need is basically your bucket name. For those of you familiar with uh, S3 storage, you create buckets uh, on the storage. And then basically the region that's hosting your storage. So in this case, the one I did, I believe, was the um, one in West Virginia, which is US East 2. So you have to find that region name, um, which is different than what you're picking. Then, of course, you need your user and password that's going to be generated. It's your keys that are generated by S3 when you're setting up your users and the path that you're using to the storage. So what that kind of looks like, uh, just to 
show you is on my ES demo server that I run on my VM locally, I kind of set up and went through the setup of it. So I have this S3 volume here and you see it loading. It loads the files fine. And if you're using dialogue functionality, you can see it pretty much functions like you would expect it to. Maybe just a little bit more sluggish, but it's hard for me right now because I haven't really benchmarked it to know whether the difference is, you know, the fact that I'm running my VM and doesn't have many re much resources versus how much S3 is slowing me down. But I've been really pretty happy with the performance of it overall, and um, it's going to be nice. Uh, I have very limited hard drive space on my laptop because of the amount of stuff I keep on it. So now I won't have to have such a large VM with demo files. I'll be able to have my file system stuff hosted on S3 and not really have any problem with that. The other interesting thing, though, that we learned during the meetings is that not only are they doing it for S3, I mean, for file system viewer, ESFS, they're also letting you do any of the volumes in ES. So in this case, on my VM, I'm running my composite um, folder on S3. So the, it's, the setup's a little bit different because instead of splitting out the username and password and the bucket and all that, it's in one defined URL you see there so you just call s3 colon slash slash and then the rest of information and you can you can use the icc profiles the input folder any of that can be hosted on s3 and that's how i'm running my vm so now i, I can have as many jobs as i want as long as i'm willing to pay for the storage on s3 which is pretty inexpensive because i'm not going to be doing that many uh read requests or write requests from it, it's going to be pretty static. So two cents a gigabyte, I'll pay for this, and it's worth it because I don't have to host it on my laptop anymore. And you see, this is basically here. So the composite file exists on the storage itself. So I thought that was nice. That was uh, kind of an unexpected thing. I didn't realize they were going that far with it. I thought it was just going to be for the file system itself. And of course, for the composite folder and all that, the fact that they're not monitoring yet doesn't matter because ES is writing those files there when you're rendering files. It's writing the preview, the XML file for the metadata. Everything's being written to a composite folder. So it knows it put it there. And actually, to show you the bucket itself in S3, I have my bucket in a few different folders. Here's a composite folder and my files inside the composite folder. And this test is my file system. So here's all my files for the file system. And since my composite folder is here, here's my file system previews and uh, metadata files in the composite folder. The other thing they're working on, or that should be working now, I should say, um, is actually being able to use input channels and output channels uh, for it. Now, I was trying to play. I didn't worry about the input channels too much. I was trying to set up the output channel, and I have a ticket in the Dalim because my password is more than 32 characters, and it won't. the password in the ES GUI won't accept anything larger than 32 characters. It's automatically generated by Amazon. So I'm not sure if, uh, looking at uh, the screenshot they have, the user that's created is from a key. So I'm not sure the password, why there's seems to be a lot shorter. As you can see in the input channel, it, it is much longer, typically. So I'm not sure what they're doing here, but I couldn't get the output channel to work or I would have delivered a file to that. Next new feature is uh, using Latitude for check-in, check-out. Those of you, if you're not familiar with Latitude, Lab Latitude's an app that Dalim can install locally on your client machine. And it lets them control some things on your client machine that they used to do using Java, but since 
all of that's kind of going away. Everything's going HTML5. HTML5 cannot control a client machine. So they created the little app Latitude that it installs in the client, very easily updates itself. Um, and they're using it for things inside of dialogue and for the check-in, check-out as well. Uh, and it basically uses the web dev protocol for that. So it locks a document, creates a private copy, and then basically you can work on that file and then check it back in to upload it back to EFs. Do a little bit of that. So if I come here, I was playing with a few of these files. Uh, it's interesting that it's not in the contextual menu, and I got to see if you can add that somewhere. But basically, you just go to check out. You can check out the whole project, and it'll download the whole project for you, or just specific document. So I'm going to do the document. What you'll notice is at the top right, it shows that the file is checked out. And I don't like this hover over, but if you see, it basically tells you the admin has it checked out, but also the tool tip for the file itself comes up and kind of blocks it. So it's not easy to get that, and they need to kind of work on that. I couldn't find any other place other than the tool tip right there that really showed who had it checked out. But what they do is they're actually writing it, and in Latitude, you actually can set the preference of where you want your files to go. For me, it's my users, home directory, and a latitude folder inside. So you'll see basically it replicates the folder structure, my customer, S3 test. Here's my file. If I open the file up in, uh, we'll do just do some quick editing to it. And save that back over. And come in here, select my file. Person would check it back in. Gives a reason, a little, little comment, and you can choose whether or not to delete the file that was downloaded to the client machine. So now that file is gone, it's deleted from here, and it's creating a revision on my ES. And here's where my ES is kind of slow creating previews, but shouldn't be too bad for this file. Come on. There we go. So now I have my file, and you can see that the change actually has been made there. And if I compare the two files, of course, you'll see the changes there. So it makes it easy to work with files straight from EOS and edit them. Obviously, it'll work with images, open up the file in uh, Photoshop or anything like that. Next feature is multi-site architecture. I don't have that set up on my demo system because I don't have the resources right now. Uh, it'll take me a little bit actually to set up the sites, but I did want to talk about how they're doing it and some of the pros and cons about it. Um, so basically, you can have multiple sites. You can have a main site that's going to host your web server your and your app server, and then could have some twists, some render engines, um, and it's going to have some primary storage as well. Um, typically, that master site is going to host the, the input folder, which all the other sites need to have access to, and I'll kind of go through that. So basically, if a user uploads a file, they're uploading it to the Apache server or to the, to the web server. Uh, in this case, I just put Apache there as a, as a web server, basically. So they're interacting with that. They're uploading the file to it. That could be the, you know, the, the ES GUI server. That server communicates with the app server saying, here's the file. The file gets put on the storage, which basically goes to the uploads folder that should be typically at the master site. The app server is going to communicate with whichever site is set for that project or for that customer, whatever you're setting it by. And then the file is going to be picked up by the renderer or twist, which, whichever needs to pick it up from the uploads folder and processes it. When it processes it, it's going to store the file on local storage at that site, which is going to host the composite folder. Composite folder is going to hold previews, uh, XMP, and 
the actual process file itself. Uh, that's the composite folder like I was showing before. The negative to me about that is since I can't split the previews from the high res file, when someone makes a request, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. When somebody makes a request for that file, it has to go from the composite folder at the remote site back up through the web server to get to that user. Now, it's just a preview image and metadata. It's not usually that big of a deal, but the other kind of thing I don't like about the architecture, now one of the things that's good, obviously, if you have to output it to a local plate setter or you make improves, it's happening local there. Even if, like if you're running it through twist to get to uh, making your proofs or you're making your plates, it's all local now to that. So you're not moving the big file from the master site down to a remote site. That's a good thing about the architecture. Bad thing though, again, is if the users exist at one of those sites, they're still communicating with the master site and they're uploading files back up to the master site just to get back to the storage that's local to them. Obviously, you can work around that a little bit by making hot folders that they can copy files to, but if you're using a lot of job ticket options or something in, in the ES upload screen, you really can't do that kind of stuff. They have to, to me, they have to work on that architecture a little bit and allow the web servers maybe to be at the sites as well. Um, one of the really good uses I see for it, because most of our customers especially, there's not many who have geographic needs like this. There's only a couple that have you know, plants in England or India and would want to take advantage of this from a geographical standpoint. But we do have customers that are kind of using ES and selling the services off of it almost as an, like it's a SaaS. And this allows you by creating sites to actually dedicate resources to those given customers. So you can charge them for two hard workers a twist and a render engine and dedicate that to them for that their projects always have the dedicated resources. So it does give us that latitude and I can see a couple of my customers doing that and using it that way. Um, the cost, there is a cost associated with sites. I forgot what the actual monetary part of it is, but you actually do license each of your sites. Uh, there was something else I wanted to say about it, but it's slipping my mind right now. All right, so plug-in components. Um, this is something they've been uh, doing. Fred, yeah. Fred, there's a question that uh, came in on the sites. Uh, it's, it's probably better to answer it now. Sure, go ahead. That you had mentioned that when files are uploaded, that they can they will go to or be assigned to the project or customer at the specific site for which they're supposed to be associated with. And the question was, how is that done? How does it know to go to site B or how does it know to go to site C? You have setups in, and I have to remember where it's at, system tools, sites. You set up your specific sites. And again, I don't have any set up. But when you have a site, you then dedicate volumes and resources, devices, to that site. Then for a given customer, and I um, don't remember offhand where it is, but I site. So here I can say this customer uses a specific site. You know, and you basically use the interface where you're linking it to whatever sites they can be linked to. So it could be linked to multiple sites, and their default site would be one specific one, just like you're doing with templates. Then in the project itself, you can also tell a project what site to be. So you have the site option here. So if that customer is enabled for multiple sites, it'll be assigned typically to the default site, or you can override it. Hopefully that answers that question. Looks good. 
Um, yeah, I remember the, the one thing I wanted to mention um, on the sites as well is they did give us a caveat. If you have an up and running um, ES and you have customers already created, um, do not try to implement sites yet. Um, cause right now, if you implement sites for them, the old projects have no way to be assigned back to a site and they won't work. I think by the official release, uh, which should be within a month, hopefully from Dalim, a five, five that is supposed to be resolved. And by default, old projects or, or old customers will all get assigned to the master site. So, so do watch that if you have an existing ES. Definitely wait until Darlene figures that part out before you jump into it. So thanks for reminding that. So plugins. So what are plugin components? And uh, Darlene, again, they talked about this during the road show this summer, visiting some customers who didn't get to go to Duo. Uh, they talked about this at Duo. And Christoph showed this uh First time last year at Worldwide Technology Meeting. The plugins are basically um, scripts, HTML, CSS that can all run or be developed by an ES customer or user. Um, they have the ability to do programming at that level or, like me, steal things and modify them. You can build stuff, plug it into your ES, and basically tap into all the standard features of ES, as well as other things is, that you can do with it. I found it uh, kind of a bit more powerful than I thought it was, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Uh, basic requirements from a licensing standpoint, there's no licensing for plugins themselves. Um, it does require, in fact, what we learned is ES5 has had the capability in the last few patch releases. Um, it does require, because you're gonna use this if you really wanna make use of the plugins, the ES API to be licensed, and you absolutely have to have the custom job ticket um, option as well. There's a system configuration that you have to do to an environment file where you com uncomment the following line that actually enables the plugins. And the plugin is just basically two pieces, or possibly more, but it can be as simple as just two pieces. Uh, you have what's called a, an ES uh, CMP XML file, which basically just defines the name of the plugin and how it can be used. So if you look at the bottom here, basically you're defining it as an ES plugin. The name in this case is one of their test ones that they give, Hello World, and the layout use is, is job. So it can only be used with project job tickets. You can also add in if you wanted to document or uh, whatever you needed to here. So the plugins can work for different components through the job ticket. And uh, typically most of them are accessed through the job ticket with exceptions that will show. Then you have the JavaScript in this case uh, for hello world.js. And basically just a little thing that says, hello, you know, hello world. So just to show how those pieces kind of go in, this is a, a view of my ES server or demo server. And basically it's just a symlinks var ES HTML plugin directory. We have subdirectories here where each of the plugins are housed. And kind of if I expand any of these, API call one, again, there's the ES CMP file. which is just very basic. Again, this can be used for jobs and it's called API call. And that's basically all it has there. And then I'll open this up real quick, but then I'm gonna show you what these look like and refer back to this. So just a quick look at them. So inside of a ES, once you create your plugin, at this level. So if I created a ESCMP file that defined a new plugin, 
I do have to restart Tomcat at that point, but I don't have to restart it every time I edit the JS file. I just have to basically restart Tomcat for it to recognize that there is a new plugin for it to use. The plugins are going to show up under your creation if you're creating job tickets. And let me go to the right ES server, look better. So here, when I'm creating job tickets, I basically have a new pull down menu here in the metadata called plugins. And here's a list of my plugins I can use inside of my job tickets. So in this case, I've just grabbed four of them, a display ID, API call, the hello world one, and one de dependency, just to talk about a couple of things they can do. So what that looks like is, here's my test ticket, and here's what the plugins are doing inside this ticket. Display ID is just a very simplistic one that shows the job number, the job ID inside of ES, and they're using some kind of internal calls for that. Um, Show it real quick. So you just call this method basically this dot get mode property get get model property sorry ID and that simply spits back like you saw here. The ID here. Then sorry. I have my API call in here, which is displaying my job ID, data creation, and the user that was used to create it. And that's my API call. And here they're calling the API, the ES API itself. Uh, an advantage here is the fact that it actually does use the key that was up created when you logged into your ES. So it uses the user who's logged in gets this and it's basically just doing a job get and specifically calling in English the creation user, the ID and creation date inside of it. Hello world, of course, just basic code that we showed before. And here's one dependencies, it just shows a little bit further of what you can do with it. And I call it dependencies because it's actually dependent on specific scripts and a style sheet. And it's calling an image by URL. Oops, and let me see back out here. So here, you know, just basic, it's calling this image. And applying this style sheet to it. So if I change red, if it's red and I change that to blue, save that back. And this is actually this is going to show another something that we're going to talk about, but I kind of breeze by that a little bit. I'm just refreshing my page so it reloads that properly. And yeah, my machine's dragging as it's saving out, uh, as it's sharing out my screen. So I'm a little bit more sluggish than I should be. There's my test ticket, and now the logo's blue. So you're able to apply CSSs, scripts, whatever you want inside of these. Um, some of the uses for it, when I initially saw this, especially in job ticket, is obviously you can do database calls maybe to a different database, an MIS system, and show some ticket information that you don't want to necessarily import as metadata inside of ES, but you want to be able to display it or have users be able to check it. So kind of your imagination can take you anywhere, what you can do inside just the job ticket itself. But what we saw is, is that we're also able to do, if you notice, I had a message popped up real quick. And if I log back into my ES, I can set it where when users log in for the first time, or when they log into ES, I can have it display a message. And you'll see that pop up in a second. 
So welcome to Blanchard Systems ES55 demo server. So it's a nice way maybe to put messages if you're hosting an ES for some customers and you plan in downtime on the weekend to put a message up to them. They log in, they're going to see server's going to be down this Saturday or it's going to be down for a couple of hours or whatever you can use this for. We saw some pretty interesting uses from uh, one of the UK users that have been playing with these for a while. And we're going to kind of play with that. Brennan's been playing with it um, and can come up with some pretty interesting stuff doing that. I thought I was pleasantly surprised. It's a lot more powerful than even than I thought even at first by just being in job tickets. The ES API, I'm not going to show anything here. I'm just going to kind of go through some of the new features. Um, so... For projects, they've added the ability to duplicate project by using the method uh, job.duplicate. Uh, being able to change the status of a job, active or completed. Um, it's not a function a lot of our users take advantage of because it is a little bit cumbersome to go in the job ticket. But especially those that use API to be able to set a project completed and kind of clean it up from all from your users having to look at a bunch of completed projects and be able to filter it to only view active is, is nice. It's nice to be able to do that through API now. You can rename jobs uh, through job edit. Um, and you can also, for those customers that use the file system and convert folders in the file system to projects, you can convert the project back to a folder on the file system as well. For documents, you're able to use document.create to cre create files inside of folders. You can do a parent class folder and create a folder structure to put your files in instead of just putting them at the root level of your project. Um, HTTP URLs with user and password are now allowed uh, in the URL to the file that you're linking to. And you're also able to, you're going to be able to use the API to set links between objects, so relationships between objects. For folders, there's a new uh, move object uh, method that allows you to move folders from one place to another. Metadata, you're able to edit metadata on a file using the production execute X SQL uh, method. And you're also able to create metadata through the API as well. For, I think that might be a separate slide. They've added a lot to production.execute.sql. I'm not going to go through all of these because it's a lot, but you're able to do things like uh, retrieving the approvers for a, doc, a specific document, things like that, through the production execute SQL uh, method. So it's nice that they're building on this and adding more to it because we do have customers taking advantage of it. Here's the, the, what I was talking about in the metadata. You're able to actually create namespaces and metadata through the API now, which is also nice if you have um, a MIS system or something, you want to push data into ES and not have to do it inside of ES. One of the things they're adding is they also have in their API is monitoring for network drives. So we have a lot of customers who have wanted to use NAS devices um, and use those as a file system for ES, but it's always been limited because you can't actually do monitoring. You can't install the Dalim JDF device on a NAS device um, or on specific file systems either. But uh, using the API, you'll be able to write scripts that maybe pull specific folders. So if you know you put something there, you're able to force ES to take a look inside that folder and browse through the structure and see the files that you've put in it. So it is a, a stopgap solution to a problem that's been around in, with ES. So there's a way at least around it. I think uh, we've had, I think Jude has created some scripts to do something similar, but now you know, Dalian is making it a little bit easier to do using the API. With that, they're also doing uh, basically live monitoring for an ESF volume. Now, I haven't really seen this. I need to get a 5.5 up that has a lot of data on a file system. But what it's basically going to show you is 
it'll be able to show you the difference between the files it sees on the file system versus what's in the database. And you can actually use the GUI at the top left when you actually select your ESFS to force a sync of that volume. And you'll see the synchronization activity on the bottom. So we actually have decent monitoring now of what's going on with our file systems, which before you'd have to kind of run a run in a console and, and take a look at it and try to figure it out. So it's nice they have this nice GUI for that now. Um, SFTP protocol is now finally supported. Uh, we have a lot of customers that have been asking for that. So basically you just call SFTP in the URL and you can use it for any of your volumes, same thing I was talking about with, with S3. So you can use it for your upload volume or your composite volume. You can use it for right now in the input channels, output channels. If I remember what they said, and Brennan, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they said by the time of the Fisher release, the output channel should be there. But it's not supported yet in this beta. Is that that's correct? correct. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Uh, that's correct, and also the user and uh, password field for the other um, S3 and all that will be like the other interface as well, instead of inline like that when you're showing now. Okay. Thank you. The workflow editor, and I'm running a bit long here, so I'll try to get through this pretty quickly. So we're all familiar with uh, ES workflows that get very large and don't fit the screen, and you have to scroll around. Um, for those of you who've been the Duo when that we've seen what the new workflow editor is going to look like, and 5.5 is going to give us that. So we take a view like this that we couldn't change the size of, and it was really hard to get tools put up, and we're now able to zoom them to fit, see the whole workflow, and beyond that, organize the workflow where I could take pieces of a large workflow like this. Uh, one of my customers may recognize their workflow here. but. Take that and actually group it into sections. So you can say I have my first part, that's all the inputs, uh, my first approvals here, my pre-flighting is in this group, that kind of thing, and actually go through it. And uh, let's uh, take a look at what that looks like. I think I got that on my ES here. Oops. One. No, it's on this one. Sorry if, I, if I'm click happy right now. And boy, my machine's really getting slow. So here's what the workflow looks like. Fit in. I can zoom in as much as I want, zoom out on it, move tools around. What you'll notice is all the tools and everything that we're kind of used to seeing are over here on the right-hand side. Grouped, I can say, well, only show me my milestones. For instance, here's my milestones. Approvals. Search works as well. And all our editing in that is made easier in this right panel as well. So if I select the tool, the twist tool here, here's my twist parameter set. You can call the expressions. Everything's nicely fit in here and much nicer interface than what they had before. So it's much more organized. You can lock tools, bypass them easily over here, delete them, add notes to them. So I can add a note to a specific tool. If I wanted to group tools, what I'm able to do is, and you can kind of see what the hints are here. So if I want to create a group, I can hold down Q. If I want to do multiple selection, I can hit Shift. Uh, so I'm going to do the Q, pull down Q, select a part of it. I kind of get my area here, name this a first group, and collapse it. And all those tools are in that piece. I can take that piece, copy it, and if I create a new workflow, Come on. Create a new workflow, give it a name. Let's 
save it and hit and return actually did say that or kind of did if I have it uh, command S works to save your workflow as well but now I can paste the tool in and here's my group that I had before and I just lost my mouse come on so there's my group and expand it whatever I want all the tools are in there all the pieces are in there that I had so much easier to work with it's going to be really nice for us that have very large workflows and need to organize it in here to be able to actually see everything and group pieces of it copy and paste between workflows all that's going to be really nice uh, you also have the link editor which they're actually doing a nice job with here as well um, yeah this is where you put in your JavaScript just like we're used to using there's a condition editor so you can actually build conditions so based on specific metadata for instance be able to say well if this is something specific contains empty not empty equals doesn't equal then do a function so editing all that is made much easier a lot less of coding or copying and pasting uh, previous program links in there so since I'm running long I won't show everything I was going to show there but but uh, very happy to have that and I think that's going to help all of us uh, some new features of the HTML5 uh, dialog uh, I'm not going to show I'm just going to go through the slides uh, basically using latitude we have closed loop calibration again remember and Dalim's really pointing this out it's not calibration of your display. Well, what they've done is because they had almost no customers actually using Dialog, the Java version, to actually calibrate the display. Most that are color sensitive always have ISOs or have their own software they do calibrations in. So what they're doing for the closed loop in ES with Latitude is basically the verification. Yeah, verification that it will go through that same process where it's showing the colors. Uh, driving your device and telling you whether you're within specs or not or would have to recalibrate before you can soft proof the file. Latitude also lets you grab the monitor profile and automatically apply that to uh, browser permitting to your page. They also use Latitude to actually control the just uh, proofing stations. Uh, so it automatically sets the environment variables through the settings inside of ES. So setting the uh, type of light, the brightness, all of those functions can be actually automatically adjusted on the light booth. Yeah, the barcode reader, which I think most people have seen and they showed at uh, Duo. <clears throat> so it creates an annotation from the barcode on the file uh, by just hovering over it. It's based on the ZXing library and supports a good number of, of barcodes. Most of the files I've found and tested, I have been able to use on those. You now have, uh, this was a feature we had in Java that we had, didn't have in the HTML5 version, but you now have the ability to order your inks, put them in the correct order, and also change the opacity of them. So if you have varnishes and things like that, you're able to put them in the correct order and show them opaque or or not a nice feature that they kind of snuck in there well is sticky tools so now if you have an annotation it stays on the annotation until you choose something else instead of having to keep hitting the annotation tool or whatever tool you're using over and over again if you're making a lot of notes especially helpful for the um, the marks And they're finally incorporating, although I believe right now we can't edit this, they do have shortcuts now. Uh, so a lot of people were upset that they didn't have their shortcuts inside of HTML5. We still have some people that need to be able to edit these, but at least the shortcuts are there for now, and hopefully we'll get editing them uh, pretty soon. In the GUI, this isn't necessarily an HTML5 uh, viewer, but you actually can right-click now on an approver and bypass them or delete them, 
uh, straight from the GUI inside of ES. You don't have to go to the job ticket and change it or get properties on the file itself. You can do it by just contextual menu, right click on that user, Emma Watson, apparently one of the Dalim guys like is fascinated with Emma Watson, and you can bypass that approver or delete them completely. So again, we went over you know, a few things which you know, I, I found kind of that stood out the most to me. There's also some other things that uh, just to mention them and if you want to contact me, we can talk about them. There's new features in the DVL. There's now full dynamic imposition, not just for Gravure uh, inside of the ES55. Of course, the SFTP protocol, we did actually uh, did wind up putting that in. Um, you can actually have a setting to only allow unique logins in ES. So those days of looking at your user management and seeing six of the same user logged in, you can actually avoid. You can force unique logins inside of ES. The user's already logged in. It won't re-log them in. You can copy parent folder rights to children automatically. Uh, we can finally duplicate and export themes. You can use for a specific user. You can do IP access filtering. So when you create a user, you can set the IP address range that he can access from. So if you only want them accessing it when they're in office, you can set that. Uh, Kibana gets a date time dashboard now, and that's probably a, um, we're probably going to do a specific webinar on some of the new Kibana stuff and uh, log dump stuff that we saw. I thought it was very interesting, but would be a whole webinar. We can now print the flat plan. Those of you that use the flat plan function inside of ES, we can print it like we used to in Mistral. Um, for a user, you can define whether the searches in ES use an and or or filter between uh, elements. Uh, web dev, it was something I was hoping to show, but the current beta version, uh, they have permission problems still with web dev. And what they want to do with that is basically like on your client machine, on your Mac or your PC, being able to actually mount an ES file system and move files on and off of it at a file system level instead of having to go through the GUI of ES or hot folders or anything like that. So that was all I had here. And let's see what questions. You have uh, several, several questions, Fred. All right. So let's get to them. Go ahead. Number one, what InDesign files work with check-in, check-out, and does it save a history of who checked it out? Um, I was trying to find the history of who checked it out, and it basically shows an open-close right now from what I saw in the history, almost like if they had just viewed it in dialogue. So I have questions to Dalim on that. I want to know a little bit more about that. To me, it seems like it's got to be somewhere. Um, but I, it, it, did to, it just showed up, and I tested it, where it showed up like if I had opened it in dialogue. So it does show the user, but it shows an open-close. So I'm not really happy with that. InDesign files, yes. It, it, any asset that's in ES, basically, because the, the check-in, check-out function is just copying a, a, a copy of that file to your local file system. And whatever you can open it in, you can open, edit, change it, and check it back in. Okay, the next question, if I interpret this correctly, uh, we often use curl commands to call the API. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, and I assume this is based on some of the things you showed, do you get direct access to the API methods via JavaScript without having to use curl? Um, Brennan may be able to answer that better, but I, I believe the answer is yes. I mean, you, you're just using JavaScript instead of using curl. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's correct. The, uh, the same calls that you can make in an external web page can now just be made inside of ES using the same JSON cookie as the main ES login. Okay, the next question, actually, I think is true in ES5, but I'll ask, and it was asked, so I'll ask, can you change the milestone of files in ES through the API? You can't specifically change the API, but you can do approvals. So 
you know, since that's the way yeah, we via, the files via the the work, so we can approve it and move it to the next milestone. Yep. Now, now, are you asking to send it to a specific step ID because there is a workflow.restart method that'll let you sure. choose a workflow and send it to a specific milestone if, you, if that's what well, you're looking for? You know, can take I'm, not asking, I'm not asking anything. This is yeah. just the way I'm phrased. <laughs> yeah, but you can, yeah, right. You can use that, uh, what Brennan was just explaining, to actually start a file that exists in another workflow at a specific step or in the same workflow. Okay, here's a here's a good one, and the answer to this one, I would say, is G. I hope so. The question is, will existing workflows easily convert to the new editor? And the answer to that is yes. The workflow I showed in the demo was actually converted from an ES45. Yes, but what about easily? It, yeah, basically same same thing as if I was going from one four five to another. Uh, I exported the workflow, imported it and you know uploaded it back into my ES and imported it and it was there everything was fine okay here's the last question and this is so i think you kind of alluded to this when you were going through the plugins so the question is i think i heard and i, I he's assuming I, I think it's based on something you stated i think i heard that es5 is if patched up can do plugins so is it true we don't have to wait to install 5.5? That's what I was told um, at the training. Uh, there was a user who had done quite a bit with plugins. And I was like, I asked him, I was like, we've only had 5.5 beta since October. Did you get an early one? He's like, no, the plugins actually have been working in 5. They just really didn't tell anybody. Okay, so this is uh, in five, it might be kind of like a hidden feature, it sounds yeah. like. Yeah. And that is well, all I had, the a, I had a couple more as I was going through, I'm really low on time. I uh, did want to mention machine learning is part, I forgot to put a slide in, but machine learning is part of ES55. So if you upload files, and I think I got a quick example. That I'll try to show real quick. Sorry for running late, but we did have a lot to cover. Let's see where I have that. I had that on mine. So I was playing with that. And the one thing I did want to mention about it, so you can look at it, and basically all of this metadata here was put in by the machine learning. One thing, if you want to play with that feature, if you get your hands on this, is you do have to set this option. Uh, where is it? Preview use deep learning has to be on in your parameter file that you're using for that workflow. So that was a caveat I ran into and had, I run into that, which is why I got rid of the slide. Uh, but other than that, you know, again, there's a lot more in there that, you know, we didn't get to go through in detail. Hopefully in future webinars, we'll cover some individually. Uh, again, this is the last one of 2017, but third Wednesday of uh, January, we'll have another webinar ready. As soon as we have the content, we'll send the mailer out for that. So I hope everyone has a Merry Christmas, a Happy Holiday, Happy New Year, and we'll see you in 2018. Thank you.